we always complain that we don't have a Google, Facebook, Amazon, or Tencent who are mm. the most profitable companies in their clusters, and they're the biggest tech drivers next to VCs. But what we have in Europe is 90% of our companies are family businesses. They are highly profitable. They are run by entrepreneurs that can make fast decisions, take more risks, think long term, that have an incredible alpha knowledge in their domain and that own global supply chains. If you take those family businesses together, I think this is our Google. Rob, my friend, we have been friends for quite a few years now. So thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's my honor and pleasure. Now, uh, I want to start, I spoke to so many of your friends and they all told me about your uh, ability to dominate the tennis court. Uh, but uh, <laughs> how did you make your way into the world of venture once you realized that beating Federer wasn't an option? <laughs> Good one. I wish I was more talented in tennis than everything would have been much easier, I guess. Um, look, if I have to put it into one sentence, I guess it's always being honest to myself to do what I love doing and really not compromising on it. I think, you know, if you look how it really happened, of course, the dots have connected in a more complex way with, with many ups and downs. So when I finished university, I was actually about to start a company and then got talked into Boston Consulting Group by a certain <laughs> Jochen Engert. Uh, and maybe, you know, Jochen, he ended up being the founder of Flixbus, which is now the biggest bus mobility company globally. So he's a very close friend. He was my mentor back then. He's also part of Visionaries. I was, again, the mentor of Max Fisman, who's on the total other side of entrepreneurship. So Max inherited a 100-year-old family business with um, 14,000 employees, 4 billion in revenues, and had to take it to the next level. And the thing that we found out back then was that there's absolutely no connect between all the new economy entrepreneurs, even though 90% of European companies are family businesses, right? So we always thought bringing those networks closer together because we think it unlocks a lot of power in B2B. It took a little until we did this. So I started my own small company in the mobile space, which I sold to Zalando and then ended up doing angel investments. And from those angel investments, we said, why don't we pool our money in a small seed fund? So that's how I started La Familia with a group of friends, which was a small 40 million angel fund back then that we invested into 30 B2B companies. And I guess we were did you know at that time you wanted to be a VC? Then you'd had you'd done some angel investments. You know, like, I enjoy doing this. But you're like, I want to be a VC. Yeah. yeah, the first time I heard of venture capital was when I was 22 at university. And I thought after the lecture, fuck, this must be the most amazing job on earth because you're looking into new companies every day, speaking to young, smart people, which are building the biggest thing in their life. And you have the privilege to choose who you want to work with and work with a kind of uh, an array of people and not just focus on one idea. So I thought maybe when I'm 50, 60 and... In case I succeed, I could become a VC, but I never thought that I would kind of become an entrepreneur in VC in the middle of my 20s without any experience. So I stumbled into it over angel investing, but I figured out it was it was my biggest passion. It turned into my biggest passion. You mentioned La Familia there, um, and you know you obviously left La Familia to start Visionaries. Yeah. What did you learn about yourself from leaving La Familia? Like I think I learned about myself from leaving Stride with Fred which is like, actually, he was fantastic at so many things yeah. that it meant that I didn't have to do them. And actually, I should have been doing them. And actually, yeah. I was just comfortable. And so I didn't force myself to be uncomfortable. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But I sure. should. And that's why I run every day, because yeah. I like to feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn about yourself? Look, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm, I'm still managing the first La Familia Fund, and I'm incredibly proud of what we've built with the team. So we've invested in 30 companies, um, many of them have turned unicorns or decacorns like Deal, Presonio, Shoko, uh, Forto, where we've had the privilege to be seed investors. And believe me, it hasn't been an easy decision then saying, you know, if you've put all your energy in something, building it, if you invented it, if you kind of, you know, put risk in it, contrarian thoughts to, to say you want to continue in a different setup. But I was at the beginning of my 30s um, and I realized that it's my biggest passion to be an entrepreneur in VC. And I wanted to do this for the next 20, 30 years. So the one thing you shouldn't do is compromise on the partnership setup because it's a very, very long-term um, game. And with Sebastian, who I founded Visionaries with, um, he has been a long friend. So we've worked on many deals together. He was my first LP in the first La Familia Fund. So we, we did uh, companies like Vey and other investments together. And he's a fabulous entrepreneur. And when he became available after selling Amovali after six years, it was basically a great setup to team up. And on the other side, you know, with Janet, um, I, I really loved working on with her. And I was the one also pulling her into our group when we started uh, the, the, the whole La Familia idea. But we're also incredibly different on how we look into deals, how we would run a company, how we would take things to the next level. So 
from you. Is What's that your... not a strength? You know, I'm always hiring team members now and I'm trying to figure out the right composition, to be honest. And I, 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 is that not a strength that they come from a different perspective and look at deals in a different way? It is. I think, you know, the best thing you can do when you're a partner in a founding team is take risks with someone that is a totally different ingredient than you have. And that's what we did. And I think that's the fund is now at 10 times the money that we invested and it's doing well. <laughs> but on the other side, you know, if you want to be in a setup for 20, 30 years, you need to have kind of a certain overlap of, of, of how you work together. And I think my, my, my synthesis is take risks when you go into those, those setups, but also be 100% brutally honest to yourself if it's sustaining and if it's the right setup for everyone. And I think it was a, was a great decision that we that we took that way because now the first fund, we're still managing it together. It's a success. Um, we've built visionaries within three years. It's a great fund, now 600 million under management. And I think um, Judith and Jeanette are doing an amazing job taking La Familia to the next level in their second and third fund based on the track record that, I, that we've built. I have to ask final thing and then we'll move on to <laughs> some quite meaty topics. Um, but it's when you get asked advice from managers raising today and who are starting partnerships today, mm -hmm. what advice do you give them on the partnership dynamic, having experienced what you have now with different partners and having mm -hmm. you know, founded two funds? What should all partnerships consider before becoming partners i think you should really spend time together about the truth of what's your purpose and what you really want to do and 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 why you're doing it together and be super honest about your strength your weaknesses what excites you and um kind of the reason why you're doing it and i think the more complementary kind of ingredients you, that you can find in a person the better it is but you need to be aligned on the on the core on, on how to do everything and I think the best thing how I did it with for example Sebastian was we really went to the deepest level of what we love doing and uh, and we were super aligned that being an entrepreneur in VC having all degrees of freedom to build this and doing this for a period hopefully of 20-30 years was really what um, what excited both of us. Do you consider yourself an entrepreneur or an investor? Um, that's the daily balance yeah. so I think you know the what what gets me up in the morning is um, basically on the one hand side we you know we we're entrepreneurs we need to build the company that we're investing with right and that's like just building any other company there's not there's no team there's no strategy there's no office there's no website so uh, it's basically just like any other company you can spend 150 percent of your time doing it and on the other side we're doing investments and our job is to find the best companies but I think exactly this combination that's why we never decided to become partner of another fund but having those degrees of freedom to build it the way you think it's right it's it's what excites me it's what gives me energy and i think it's what makes me a good investor for founders because i have an entrepreneurial passion of building something and not just an abstract investor i think it's like, what investors yeah. don't anticipate though when they spin out like the firm build yeah. aspect is like i mean it's 50 percent of my day or more and i'm sure yeah. it's probably 50 percent of yours everything yeah. around team management and everything we discussed yeah. i think people forget that can I ask, we, we, you've founded now two firms of visionaries, um, as have I. Um, <laughs> uh, what's the fucking hardest element of building a firm? Uh, I think it is this balance of being an entrepreneur and being a VC. You know, Christoph Jan's SaaS napkin, you know, which yeah, is called yeah. SaaS companies. I did it for fun uh, in venture capital to my team, kind of a driver tree with all the things that you have to do at the same time. But I think, you know, it's all about the team then that you build that really unlocks the power of the company and, and what you can get out of it. And in venture capital, it's incredibly difficult to, to hire people because they need to be hyper smart, humble, visionary at the same time, no linear thinkers. So I think it's it's hard to find them. But the way we decided to to do it is is basically not hiring experienced people who have been in VC and who just apply the logic that they've learned in another fund. But go for incredibly young, hungry, hyper intelligent, and people that really want to go exponential in their development. Because I think that's what takes so, your firm. So, man, I need I, I, again. The reason the show is successful is because I I literally just use it to learn myself. Uh, my question and concern there is like obviously I need to hire, <laughs> uh, <laughs> as all my LPs tell me. Um, but. I don't want to hire someone with no experience because you can't just give them a check, but you need to put mechanisms around them to learn, yeah. to grow. I, we don't have the time or space to do that. Mm -hmm. You need to just run from day one. Mm -hmm. So did you put the mechanisms in place? And if so, what are those mechanisms? 
look, in the beginning, you're doing everything, right? So it was just Sebastian and I starting the fund and you're CFO, you're chief media officer, you're chief investment officer, and you, you just cover everything. I think it's also important to give the DNA of what you think you want to do different into that company. But then it's also important to not micromanage the whole time, but really in the best case, find people who are so much better than you are in each of those dimensions to really take things to an exponential development. And I think that's that's the balance after like a year when in the beginning it's easy. You don't have a portfolio to cover. You have enough time to look how you design your office or website, but then you start doing investment and then you have 30 companies in the portfolio and then you don't have time to do this anymore. You, you can't be kind of everywhere. So that's why I think the best mechanism that we put in place is that we hire people that we give 50% a job description of why we need someone and 50% we give them the degrees of freedom to use their time to really unlock what they love doing, what they're good at, and what really, really in turn brings our company to the next level. What would some examples be? Take Lisa. So Lisa is a great example. She joined us as an intern. Uh, okay. She initially applied to become part of the investment team uh, as an associate. And then uh, she was spending two or three months with us and we, we thought she was exceptional on, on how she connected with our founder LP base, family entrepreneur base, how she hustled with our uh, portfolio founders. And we said, you know, we were sitting together after three months and said, why don't we start an experiment and you just own our platform, but not like platform in a traditional way, having a recruiting team, just build whatever you think, any alpha that we can unlock on our kind of visionaries platform. And she, in the last three years, has built such an incredible kind of... <sighs> events that she's organizing on visionaries how she's connecting the dots behind the scenes that um yeah do you know what i find so funny about you i don't think i've ever told you this i have so many people tell me like lisa martin or whoever it is in your team harry you should try and hire these people and i'm like i know <laughs> But Rob's such a good friend. <laughs> I mean, out of my team, but poaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah literally. I'm like, I would love to, but I could never do that. Um, no, if, I, if we get you in, in return, uh, some, some PR and media I don't think it's a trade. That'll, uh, that, that'll be fun. Right? I, no, I, I love that. What do you think of the biggest... Actually, sorry, before we move on to that, uh, uh, I'm the thing I'm struggling with is actually this entitlement. Uh, you know, I, I want 500k salary, I want 500k bonus, uh, and I want... Uh, like, it's all I want... I want I want and there's this real entitlement I find in kind of 25 to 35 year old venture mm -hmm. hiring how should I deal with that it's I think it's an adverse selection like those are not the people that we want to get with with visionaries it's the other way around so if someone is asking for a high salary that person is not willing to take risks it's not willing to it's not believing enough in the entrepreneurial spirit to to really kind of build something essential because we say we, we don't pay high salaries at visionaries. I think if you go to some of the multi-stage funds in London, maybe you get twice the salary, but we're pretty generous with carry and people know that they can build a career faster than at other funds if they perform extraordinarily well. And if they, if they are great co-entrepreneurs building visionaries. And I think these are the kind of people that we, that we want to want to take on board. And if you look at Martin, he became partner just after three years. Of joining visionaries but he's a co-entrepreneur already kind of leading the seed fund sahar is doing the same for the growth fund lisa is doing the same for the platform these are incredibly young hungry hyper intelligent people that haven't been in vc before i think that's the beauty you know if you you can do it super easy and say look i just poach from other funds i hire people who have been three years in vc they have the networks they know how to look at deals you just get an average index of all the other funds if, if, if you do this i think if you want to build the contrary on own DNA, you need to go for people that are unbiased, that want to grow exp exponentially themselves and that have the trust that over time this will pay out and not the people that say, look, I know finished Harvard and now I want to have a 750k annual salary, otherwise I go to Goldman, <laughs> Fine, they, they should go to Goldman because then it's the better safer environment now, I guess, if I, that makes sense. I think hiring is where a lot of people go wrong. When you think about biggest mistakes that other managers make that you yeah. see around you what do you think are some of the biggest so you know i'm so young myself and, and just at the very beginning so i'm not sure if i'm the right person to no oh, fuck that's totally on, like, uh, I, I, what, I, what you can do better uh, many learnings i'm doing myself but i think maybe the first thing is that not having a clear kind of differentiation about your proposition why the market needs you like if you want to be a new fund for a cap table of a founder you need to be a painkiller, not a nice vitamin. 
And I think if you don't have this value propo proposition that is new for the market, that's something difficult. Second thing is I think many new managers start investing into hype deals because it's kind of nice to sneak into th things that are kind of validated by other funds. But again, you just build an index of what's already there. I think you need to... I think it also, but I, I think, you know, I don't mean it pushing back, but it does help with LPs. Like yeah. being able to get into hype deals yeah. bluntly shows access yeah. and it shows ability to win allocation in the best yeah. of the, the best of the best real time with no data deals. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. if we operate in a world of no data, the hypest deals would seem to be the most attractive. Yeah at this real-time moment. Do you I think know what it's I mean? fair. Maybe build a blend, right? If you show that you can get allocations in some of those great hype deals, it's fine if it's 20% of your portfolio. But I think it's so much more impressive if you have chosen companies that others haven't seen and after five years it turns out to be one of the most successful companies in the market. I well, think that's it. This is interesting. I actually spoke to a multi-stage GP earlier this morning. Yeah. I, sorry, I didn't reflect it in the schedule, so it's a surprise. Um, and they said the interesting <laughs> thing with visionaries is like when you look at their early stage like practice, they yeah. believe that actually you generate returns at early stage by picking when really everyone else is much more focused on breadth and volume, yeah. which I think is probably true. I, how do you think about the picking at seed and whether it's really possible to honestly do a concentrated strategy at seed yeah. and pick well? I mean, I think on the extreme, um, either you run the Y Combinator seed camp kind of model where you're just um, basically building a broad portfolio and the likelihood to have like one or two of those amazing so where your iPath kind of outliers is almost given. So you're basically building a seed index on the really best of the best founders. But then you you can't get your your ownership that if something is really a crazy home run, you get to 20x your fund or 25x. So you'll have an incredibly good performance and, and those funds are doing super well. That's the one game. And the other one is like building a more concentrated portfolio where... The truth is you won't even get that though. Like if you look at doing 100 to 250k or even 400k yeah. in a UI path at seed, uh, listen, that will do unbelievably well. But if you have a 100 million fund and you did a 250k check... Yeah. 100x is 25 million, yeah. 400x is your fund. Yeah. yeah, you could three, do you see what I mean? Like yeah. 1200x would be three times your fund. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard, but look, I think, and, and then the other model is that you try to build a more concentrated portfolio of 25 companies where picking is more important, of course. So you can get it wrong and the fund is zero or one. But if you get it right, and I think you have 25 chances to really get it right, then you get it very right. If you have two or three companies that, where you have your 10, 15% ownership, let's say you have a hundred million fund, companies 10 billion, you have your 10%, right? It returns your fund a few times. And if you have two or three of those companies, but I think in the end... Can I ask, is 10% your like, your threshold? I remember being with Fred at Stride and it was like under 10, we were like, ah. Uh, yeah, so look, we, we say 80% of our seed portfolio is 10 to 15% ownership yeah. and 20% will leave room if there are exceptional teams where there's maybe another setup is more interesting for them teaming up with a multi-stage fund or um, it's just a different round setup or maybe we're not 100% confident about the space but we want to learn and then, then we keep kind of 20% for... Do you, wor do you worry yeah. that then like uh, Lightspeed or Excel or Index will say to entrepreneurs, oh, we're in another deal with Rob and Visionaries and they only have 3%. So actually in this next one, we can cut them down. My worry is that if you do do those, you allow yourself to be pushed down yeah. in others. No, so we were pretty clear about that strategy. You know, we're, and, and you asked like two minutes ago um, about can you have a concentrated and focused portfolio? And I think it's also a little bit on how you like working as a VC. We love spending a lot of time with the founders. That's our, 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 our passion. So we want to rather have maybe five to 10 investments a year in a seed fund, spending time with the founders and uh, then, then just having maybe 40 deals and just knowing maybe the name of one or two founders. And um, I think as long as as you get that message across to the founders and also get the, that referencing on, on how you work with them, and then I think it's a fair value proposition where founders then need to decide, look, either it's a good partner to take visionaries on board with 10 or 15% or or not. And I think with this two or three percent deals, for, for us, you know, we we're, we're doing it with maybe two or three deals of fund and we were pretty clear about um, about the strategy and, and we, we don't make a difference then 
kind of how we work with the founders. Well, I think the interesting thing here that I, I want to discuss next, because it's important for both of us actually in our fund strategies, because we both do the barbell approach. Yeah. And so that unlike just a seed only strategy, I think there is a strategic yeah. reason as to why you, so like, can you just walk me through the two funds and how it's a little bit different than maybe just a traditional fund setup? Yeah. Look, I think the main difference, if you if you look at visionaries, is that on on our investor side, we only have successful entrepreneurs. So on the one hand side, we have thirty unicorn founders that have built great digital companies, like the founders of Myro, UiPath, uh, Hello Fresh, Flixbus, um, and on the other side, we have twenty five family entrepreneurs who are on the total kind of other side of entrepreneurship. They are owning the old economy, and they can be interesting customer groups. And the way we thought about it is like, how can we add the best value to the ecosystem with this network strategy and we feel it's on the one hand side you know if you look at pre-seed seed where europe is incredibly decentralized so you need 10 partners speaking 10 different languages yeah. if you really want to cover all clusters and that's where we think you know having those great entrepreneurs who've built companies or operated companies like spotify or uipath uh, or in the netherlands molly that like that's a great source for deals for us and at the same time do you actually get are, deals sorry i'm being really rude yeah. do you actually get deals from them I, i've had like the good and the great in my funds yeah. they never send me deals <laughs> <laughs> like they might whatsapp me but they don't send deals yeah um no i mean that's that's how we've we've built visionaries we've we've built it from scratch just around this founder ecosystem right so the way we source deals i'd say some 60 70 percent are through our wow. founder networks that we typically were operated in whatsapp groups and that's kind of how they share deals, but it's also kind of when we need an advice on whether it's fintech investment, we might might consult with Adrian for Molly or, or people in that space. If it's something in the, I don't know, you you name it, kind sure. of enterprise SaaS, then maybe Daniel from your iPath or Brandon are, are great sparing partners. And I think that's that, that's how we've built everything around exactly that idea, and that's the core of our sourcing and and kind of network approach. Uh, and so you have pre-seed and seed, and then we have. Not a series A. We have a series B and C. Yeah. So how does that work out in terms of fund sizes, just so everyone can understand? Exactly. So I, I, I start answering that question again. <laughs> Sorry, you were asking what's the strategy. So um, yeah, we, we think, you know, if you look at Europe, um, when we started Visionaries, we thought series A was pretty crowded. You have incredible amount of funds with kind of 100 to 700 million in fund size yeah. that typically enter series A, but that has been bloody red ocean. Uh, and I think valuations have been quite aggressive uh, compared to the traction that the companies had. And at the same time, it's not yet a space where we can add so much value with our network. So we said, we're good at pre-seed seed. So that's basically, we've all been entrepreneurs before and we will love working with founders really at those dirty early stages. And then we leave out Series A, so there is no signaling risk for the founders and they can choose from those amazing funds out there, whether it's an Excel, a Sequoia, an Index, or you name them, who are amazing lead investors. And then again, for us, it's really interesting at Series B when B2B companies start hyperscaling. They need to build a customer base across Europe. That's where our family business entrepreneurs can be interesting, whether it's all the car companies, the, the Milis, the Swarovskis of this world. And uh, that's also where founders, you know, if they want to get go-to-market advice, they better want to speak to like Hannah Rena from Presonio, who has just scaled the company across Europe. Or if they want to have more product advice with an Andre who founded Miro and not just kind of with... Um, with average advice. So that's where we think we can bring in a lot of value again at Series B stage. But on the other side, you know, we thought the best product we can offer to founders is not another 1 billion fund that competes with those funds out there, but complementing great pain kind of uh, multi-stage US funds in uh, in those rounds with a 5 to 10 million investment. You, you mentioned kind of the Red Ocean there. We're going to get to that. I just want to ask quickly, you know, you lead rounds at you know, pre-seed and seed. We're seeing a totally different fundraising environment now. Where yeah. You remember before when it's like, ah, do, do you need your pro rata? And then they're like, oh, everyone else wants to. You're like, great, okay, take it. Yeah. In like every company, even terrible companies, yeah. um, <laughs> respectfully. Um, and so my question to you is like, how does your reserves management change today mm -hmm. versus years of old? Because it's shifting for sure. Yeah. It's actually not in the current fund. I mean, we, we have 60% reserve in a seed fund to, to follow on. You have 60 percent reserve. 60 percent. Wow! So 40 percent is initial. 40 percent is initial. 60 How big is the seed fund? Is reserve. It's uh, the latest one is 150 million. Wow! So that's before. so you've got like 70 million for initial checks or 65 million for initial checks. Yeah. Wow! That's not many. Yeah. 
And I mean, we're, we're trying to build a focus portfolio there. And then, you know, typically you can follow on in series A and in series B, you can do either full or half parada. It depends mm -hmm. a little on the price points of the companies, round sizes. And I think, you know, why we haven't made a change in the current fund. I mean, what drivers do you have that would change your strategy? Either you have a momentum market, which we had the last two years, <laughs> but um, we try to avoid investing into momentum companies. I think we have done none of them. And we try to be incredibly disciplined with our founder to raise what they really need to raise and what is necessary and not like going to momentum fundraisers where you basically just put in more money without knowing what it is. Second reason could be that you have um, kind of not good companies in your portfolio and you still send them to family offices to raise money or kind of stretch. <laughs> We're riding off those companies and, and with the founders deciding not to continue if the model doesn't work. Like, why why should we kind of encourage them to raise more money to just postpone the decision? And the third reason could be that you're such an amazing picker that you have so many companies in the fund that are outperforming that you don't have enough money to put into that. And that's something where typically opportunity funds or the late stage fund could then come into place to take care of it. So long story short, with our existing fund, we haven't made any change to the reserve management, but we've done the new fund. We've increased the fund size to 150 million because the initial check size sizes are just getting getting bigger. No, totally. I see that. I mean, you you think about how about it. yourself? I mean, with uh, with your seed fund, um, and you have been in some great deals that that have raised quite quite significant up rounds. Right? Yeah, I, I think about it really in two types of deals that we do. One is uh, where we like to have a really meaningful check size. So we have 33 million in the early stage and 107 in the you know Explorer fund, which is really series uh, A and B. Um, for me, it's two deals. One is where we kind of try and take a lead as much as possible. So 750 yeah. to one and a half, very much similar to kind of how any traditional seed fund would want to concentrate in the best companies. And then the other one is this like recognition that I'm doing too now, where bluntly we're behind some amazing multi-stage fund, which we're going to get to is leading it, um, who I'm very close to in, in two different contexts. And actually, do I want a 250K check in one of the potential best breakout yeah. companies? 100% because I can absolutely earn the right to put more in over time, I hope. Yeah. The question that I have is, and um, time will tell, <laughs> in the best companies, do you have the ability to concentrate capital yeah. over time? I think that's my question to you. Mm -hmm. Do you think in your true breakouts, you'll be able to concentrate money from the larger growth fund? Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, if you look at it um, with the seed fund, typically you can play until series B and then, I mean, the round size, it, 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 it's not working anymore yeah. with your allocation. And that's where the growth fund comes into place where we invest five to 10 million, which is Interestingly, mostly in allocation we get on top at that stage. Yeah. So we invest as long as we can from the seed fund. What sort of price is it then? Mm -hmm. Is it like 500 to a billion in that range? Um, no. So I think the the average entry price point for our early growth fund, it's really early. It's not growth, right? So it's, I would call early series B or late series A. It's it's around 100, 100 million. So there are many companies like Central, Textu and others that, that we entered at far below 100 million. There are a few ones that have been a little more pricey when we enter, but we haven't done any round at a, at a 500 million or a 400 million in the last two years. I've done a couple of seeds at 100 million. So, like, well, there <laughs> I mean, <laughs> listen, um, it's not, I, I was in, uh, in IC with Kieran today and he was explaining something to someone. And he said, we like cheap deals. Uh, and I said, fuck, no, we don't. That's a bad, <laughs> bad answer. We like the best deals, <laughs> which can be expensive. Um, but those those were slightly toppy. Yeah, 100 yeah. million seats. Uh, you've got to have someone pretty special. But look, I think we, we did things wrong there because if you look at those later stage rounds where we thought they had been too expensive and, and maybe didn't fall on a second time with the early growth fund, those have been the outlier companies and they have always been expensive. If you look at... Wait, which ones were those? If you look at Presonio, if you look at Deal, if you look at even, you know, Shoko, all those companies have done incredibly well. They 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 have been the ones that, that have outperformed and they have Pigment, great example. So we were in the pre-seed and uh, I mean, what an amazing team and Eleonore building it with, with her co-founder. But... That has always, Ophelia did the A, we thought, wow, that's an expensive price point. Just for Everyone thought that was an expensive and, price uh, point. I think credit, we thought it's expensive, but they have shown like uh, it, it would have been cheap in retrospect. So I think a learning is if, if you have those outlier companies, 
um, I think you have to pay those price points if you have the internal knowledge of kind of how the founders are doing and if you have the trust in what they're building. I think that's where I give credit to Ophelia though, because there wasn't the data respectively to support the price that she paid at Incredible the A. Well and like foreseeing that, fucking pissed. I really wanted to be in Pigment. <laughs> I, I, I think they're just such a good team. Have you ever, but, but you have the chance with the growth fund, right? I, I, Is it not yeah. too expensive? It's pretty fucking expensive. <laughs> uh, no, uh, I have I have some discipline, I hope. Um, <laughs> do you think the Series A product is good in Europe? You mentioned Sequoia, uh, Excel, and Index. I completely agree. That's what everyone says. That's it. For uh, Europe, for continent entrepreneurial talent, there's really three firms. No, I, I would disagree. That that was the case four years ago. And I think it was cozy for those firms because they could just like select what they wanted to do. And then and, and the pressure has been just competing against two or three other firms. I think the beauty is, you know, now we have maybe five to 10 times what you would call a tier one VC firm from the US that entered the market in the last two years, whether it was <gasps> Sequoia or General Catalyst, Lightspeed, Iconic, go to everyone opening offices in London. And I think it puts so much pressure into the market on existing funds to bloody innovate themselves and really, really kind of get ahead of the way of doing a great job with, with founders and referencing that I think this competition is great for founders because they have more choice. They have VCs that are really need to be on their toes to, to be great VCs with the companies that they back. And I think it's a positive effect for Ecosystem from the founder perspective. So I've done three seed deals in the last de well, in the last two months. What is it? End of February. Seed, so not a right uh, last yeah. seed deal. So, yeah. but this is impressive. Like three seed deals, yeah. all tier one US, yeah. all beaten tier one U UK and Europe. Yeah. And then I spoke to an LP, and they said, "Why would I put money in European funds at the A? Because I'm just yeah. betting that." they would get something that a US fund missed. Yeah. Do you think that's short-sighted and unfair? And do you think you'd be worried if you're a Series A fund today when the US guys are coming in harder than ever and winning? Yeah. I mean, I can't speak for Series A because we're, we're, we're not engaged in that space that much. But from our portfolio, you mentioned Seed. I, I don't see it the, the same way, but, but maybe let me put it in a different way. I think those founders that we want to back are those guys that really do deep referencing on the funds that they want to work with and have a mm. super clear kind of impression why they want to work with which fund. It's like a wedding. You can't get divorced. And <laughs> so I think those founders that are just hyped by US brand putting in 3 million in a seed round or 5 million without thinking about the so what are not the founders we want to back because that's not the long-term thinking. Those founders that really go deep into referencing, we see actually many conversations where they might go rather 4.9 or visionaries or 20 VC or whoever for the seed stage because they're closer to uh, to those partners working with them. They are meaningful check in our funds because we're smaller funds. We work hard. We want to make everything. And they're independent in this series A round to really choose from a great fund with a significant check, a board position from a partner, not an associate. So I think, long story short, it's self-selection. Those founders that go with US funds and really know why, because either they want to go into the US market or they have a certain alpha in whether it's gaming industry or something, fine. But I see, to be honest, two thirds of the founders at seed stage that have those term sheets rather going for European seed fund setup because they want to keep the A round open to, to choose from those funds. How do you advise founders when it comes to, when they have a US multi-stage fund yeah. and they're debating that or a European offer? How do you advise them? Yeah. I think, um, you know, for there is no right or wrong. It's, I just want to advise them to to make a very active choice about the so what of the setup and the, the cons of doing a multi-stage fund setup at seed is you're a very small check of a huge fund. And the moment you sign the term sheet, you need to ask yourself, did they just buy an option to lead the next round? Or does the partner really, really go all in, go in my board and spend the time with me because the such multi-stage funds can't do 150 seed rounds a year and, and kind of keep that quality. Second thing is they need to be aware that the signaling risk if that fund doesn't lead the next round is... Do you buy that? I just had yeah. David Tish on the show from Box Group and he was like, nah, signaling uh, risk is the biggest load of BS. Yeah. 
I've seen it many times in our portfolio. We we, we team up a lot with multi-stage funds at seed. I, I'd say 20% of our deals are like this. And so when they don't and come back, it does look bad. It It is terrible for you as a founder if things don't work out. Look, there, there are three scenarios. Either you kill it and everything is amazing, then it doesn't matter. I mean, then everyone wants to do your A round. It doesn't sure. matter. Yeah. And then li likely the seed fund, like the multi-stage fund at seed will also preempt the A round. If things go pretty good, pretty great, but not like incredibly great, likely the multi-stage fund wouldn't preempt the next round and just see how things go because they got their for, for kind of ownership. They make a new decision with a new investment committee at the series A stage, whether it is a great investment or not. And they likely stand on the sidelines. And if things go bad, then they wouldn't pick it up. And believe me, behind the scenes, I mean, every fund knows exactly if partner X of multi-stage fund Y is not leading the next round that there, there's a reason for it. And we've seen it many times with really good companies that have good metrics, but maybe we're not killing it yet, uh, that, that they had trouble really getting great fund ICs from other multi-stage funds because they do referencing with the partner. And it's just not true if a partner then says, look, it's a great company and we have our core ownership and that's fine and someone else can do it because Everyone knows if the deal is amazing, they bloody preempt it. But, but also, actually, the hard one is the messy middle there, which is like actually the company going actually pretty yeah. well, but it's not enough where you're like, we're going to preempt it aggressively. Because then everyone else goes, well, why aren't X actually being so aggressive? If it was yeah. really good, they would be. And so even yeah. good isn't good enough. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Eight, seven and a half, eight out of ten. Yeah. The other thing I always so think is like price optimization. And founders don't think enough about this, which yeah. is just like... If you knock it out of the park, yes, sell aggressive preempt, yeah. but you are misaligned because they're already in. They do not want to optimize for pricing on the next round in terms yeah. of getting the highest price possible. Yeah. They want to crush your price. Yeah. Whereas me and you are totally aligned with founders because yeah. we just want the best price on the next round. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And look, I think there is a lot of beauty if you're independent as a founder. If you go for a seed fund setup or great angels, you can choose maybe from... 100 tier one funds globally or tier two to lead that round and the likelihood i mean just speak to mickey from vault who said 70 funds passed and Love fund mickey. number 71 i mean he was in your podcast picked it up yeah. imagine it had been more a more difficult journey if he hadn't been independent to kind of choose from any fund but look there are many pros also going with a multi-stage fund like some have 40 50 years experience of supporting companies some partners are incredible to have on your board but just make sure as a founder to challenge that and to ask the partners will you be on my board or will you just send your associate on my board or <laughs> well the yeah. savage thing when i'm not performing <laughs> will you transition to your associate <laughs> I mean, fair enough after two years but uh, so you um, know when it's like and you know now sarah will take over and you're like oh yeah. damn it relegated yeah. if you could choose one european board member who would you choose and why in the series a i choose johan butting who's global svp sales at slack and he has built slack in europe Dropbox in Europe, and he's a board member in our portfolio company, Central, where I'm in the board with Luciana from Sequoia and uh, Mark from Frygeist. And he's spending so much time with the founders to really build a commercial team, build a go-to-market team. He has done it for the last 12 years, but not on a VC high level, really. He, he has gone on any details. And this is the kind of sparring partner you want to have uh, as a founder if you build a SaaS company, not just high level bullshitting on I, I, uh, on some some generic advice but really going going deep I'm, I'm very impressed by him do you think vcs add value we always get like you know, shunned and mocked for our vc value do you think we add value yeah it depends on how they operate i i think small boards are great because it forces everyone really really to work hard because yeah. if you just have two board members and you don't work then it's kind of obvious you're going <laughs> second thing is uh i think the best board or role that you can take as a vc for a founder is not trying to influence any decisions or to think that you have better ideas than the founder, but to be the best devil's advocate that you can with kind of opening up the option space for the founder. And that's mostly not yourself having an opinion. It's mostly bringing in people from your network. In our case, it's founders who've gone through that journey, who have solved that problems to really provide the best possible devil's advocates opinion so that the founder can choose what's the right decision to do. And I think those kind of boards are exceptional and, and giving the founder stability. But I think big boards can be really very difficult if you have 10 board members with 10 opinions, which are all high level. <laughs> and um, then the founder doesn't really know like which direction to choose. And then maybe the most dominant board member 
is forcing more the direction which the company needs to go. Yeah, I think then a board is a, is a pretty negative and terrible thing. Where do you think VCs and founders are misaligned? We sometimes see boards being misaligned with founders. They want to sell, they don't want to sell. A founder does want to sell. Where do you think that boards and board kind of VCs and founders are misaligned? Uh, it's a great question. So um, I think it's opportunism. So as, as a VC, you know, um, you can invest in 25 to 30 companies per fund and mm -hmm. you can, and you know, you really see who's a VC keeping the word when things go negative and if they still spend time with the, with the founders, it doesn't mean they should spend all of their time. And I mean, they should focus on the winners also in the portfolio, but they should also be there when things go, 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 go negative. Um, but I think VCs can always, you know, opt out or, or be opportunistic to just focus on what's going well and where they see value in their portfolio, where founders have this one shot at that moment in time that they need to get right. And I guess that's that's a bit of a misalignment. I, I, How do you see it? Uh, I think around liquidity mm -hmm. um, is probably the biggest, whereby, especially I think in the next few years, it'll be really prominent, which is whereby you have venture funds with not a lot of DPI yeah. situate, and they know that they need DPI more than ever to raise their next yeah. funds. Uh, liquidity opportunities come about in secondaries, in sales, in PE sales. Yeah. And actually, it is suboptimal for the founder to have them sell a large portion of secondary, or it's suboptimal for the founder to sell now. Um, but the board absolutely want it, or the VCs absolutely want it. Yeah. I think that's to me the biggest by far. Yeah. Um, and so I think I think that's the one I worry about, especially over yeah. the coming years. Yeah, but then it's again, I think you know, when you team up with the founder as a as a VC and vice versa, it's more like. Do you align in general on how you want to build that company and and uh, and the journey that you want to take? Sometimes it's more aggressive, sometimes it's less aggressive. But if founders want to do 150 million secondary in the Series C round, as it sometimes happened in the last two years, then I think it's a it's a general misalignment of of a setup that, that I wouldn't back as a. I as a I, I feel quite sorry for people in those situations. I'm going to get a lot of hate for that because everyone like demonizes them now. They were actively pursued to sell. Like they didn't go into market and say, I want to sell 150 million. That's a very different thing then. I was not referring to that kind of group. Do you see what I mean? That I think sure. often they're demonized and it's like these yeah. big growth firms like Rob will take your stock at any price. Yeah. And it's like, well, if I own 50%, sure, I'll sell you 10%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's very fair. I was more referring to, so I think with, it's an interesting discussion on secondaries and, you know, we're supporting it a lot because many of our founders and also the founders that, that back us at Visionary say, you know, when they did a five... Million secondary or something in the space that you that you have a little certainty that you don't need to. Have you can buy a house. Nights. You can buy you security. Can buy a house. You know, yeah. you can send your kids to school. That makes you more relaxed to build a great company and take risks and be a good entrepreneur. But is it different if you're doing a secondary on that level, or maybe also can be it can be a little higher or lower, or if you basically take a, a fortune <laughs> off <No>. the table? <laughs> I don't know but, about you, but I think a lot bigger now that I'm not worried about losing my home. I'm not rich, but I, I don't worry about losing everything, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah. Uh, and I and now I'd go for bigger swings. Yeah. I do cooler <laughs> shit. <laughs> I, I, how do you think about your relationship to money? Do you think about it? Yeah, look, so I think um, as as odd as it sounds, but uh, and, and I'm, I don't want to say that I'm absolutely not interested in money, but I think my, my North Star is really, as I mentioned in the beginning, if I do what I love doing every day, and typically that's also the intersection of what you love doing, what you're typically good at, because otherwise you don't love doing it, and that that the rest will just come. And I think we're in a business with venture capital that if you do this over 20, 30 years, um, you don't need to worry that if, if you do well, that, that that there will be a lot of financial flexibility. But but that's not really what, what motivates me. I mean, I'm I'm passionate every day working with founders. I'm passionate about our network and I'm I'm taking a very long-term perspective of what we're building. We didn't do many secondaries, for example, in our portfolio, which would have been maybe attractive because we still believe those companies have such a great uh, kind of journey um, ahead of them. What was your so, biggest mistake of 2020 to 22? Like mine was not doing secondaries in companies that uh, I probably should have done secondaries in. Uh, what was yours? Between twenty and twenty-two, ah, oh, got so many. Um, <laughs> big one on the on the fun side. <laughs> um, I think the 
biggest mistakes, if you're referring to market, maybe what I mentioned earlier, that some of the really great winners in our portfolio, maybe we should have backed at the later stages even more aggressively, but we thought they were pricey, but maybe mm. they weren't. I think a mistake on company building may be starting to hire a great team a little too late. I mean, you... <laughs> Well, it's a story it's of a your life, uh, but <laughs> it's shot off. <laughs> uh, is it, no, but it's, it's a tough one because you want to retain the quality bar, yeah. and you also want to be cognizant that you know yeah. I don't I don't like hire fast. That's yeah. not my style, um, yeah. and I think you've got to go slow to go far. Yeah. Um, but then you also have to go <laughs> just at all. So it's really fucking hard. Yeah. Um, I don't buy remote, by the way. I think mm. remote is one of the most poisonous things. Yeah. Um, yeah, it says deal investor. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's not just remote work. It's, it's like uh, international hiring. You know, if you want to build uh, any subsidiaries, you know, they're, they're, I think that's also where they're taking a lot of advantage from. Sure. No, I totally get you. We, we mentioned kind of relationships to money. We mentioned price there. When you're like investing, say, initial, how central a role does price actually pay? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because you can always have this argument, oh, great founders, you need to back no matter what price point and they go up. I think that's not the right way to approach it. The right way is if you speak with a founder, so we, we've never had a negotiation at the seed stage with the founder about price point because we wanted to have 1% more or 2% less. Our dialogue is always, do we have the same understanding on what we think are the next steps to build a great company? And I think if you have that alignment with the founder, you want to go for a healthy journey that feels right for the company to, to do a seed round, to have enough runway, to have a great position and optionality for a series A round. And if it's an incredible serial entrepreneur that has built the product already 10 times, maybe a 5 million round is fine, even though it's expensive because you know they will have a product live in sure. six months and maybe they can raise the next round with 2 million AR and, uh, and, and fine. But on the other side, if you have a, a team, you know, that is raising, like building a productivity tool for the first time, raising 5 million on 25 and they say, look, in one and a half years, we want to raise 30 million on 150 million. That's not for us because we think like it's it's not a healthy setup for them to build a great company because they don't have any optionality for the A-Round. So we're trying to figure out with the founders what's the right strategy to move forward. And we are very passive. We are not doing pricey deals. We are, we've passed on many companies that were doing those U.S. rounds because U.S. funds for them, it's easy. Demar, you got me for that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that that's kind of your uh, a sweet spot. <laughs> your sweet spot. But look, look, those can be great companies, but if, if you're Ribbit or if you're one of those U.S. like you can pay six, eight million in the seat round, fine, right? On, on good teams. We, we like to go a little deeper and understand. Um, I, th I think for me, the question I always ask is if we think about funding rounds as like science experiments and yeah. we have a hypothesis to prove out, yeah. what is the hypothesis we're looking to prove out, which when proved, yeah. we will be able to raise the next round. Yeah. And I think saying, hey, we will be in 10 large enterprise accounts with more than 25 seats. Yeah. We'll have 25% upsell from there. That is... That makes me really comfortable. I'm like, yeah. okay, I, it's yeah. when it's like, I, I, I'm not so sure. And yeah. I think clarity around what is required, and it will change. Yeah. Markets change. But just a, some sense of direction around how I yeah. need to scale traction wise, yeah. I always find that crucial. I think it's uh, as a founder, exactly, I would 100% agree. And we've now 50 SaaS companies in our portfolio, and we've seen different pathways, but we never see like any company that is doing great has had great times and terrible times. And I think at the seed, you know, it's the first decision on if you do the pricing on the optionality that you have for the A. So if you do a 3 million seed round with a healthy setup and things don't go that well, it's fine. You can still raise a great A round because you're sitting on a valuation where you can grow in it. Yeah. If you're doing a ballsy seed round of, of 5 to 10 million and if you, after one and a half years and two years, and that's happening with 80% of the companies, if you're not there yet... You, you, you either have to bloody raise a down round, which you don't want to do, or you're in a momentum market like the last two years, but then it just takes maybe one or two years later until you figure out that you're then at a 500 million valuation and still can't raise anymore. But then I, I so, oscillate between it because I think like the biggest crime that Europe does often is we underfund our companies or in yeah. the future, in the past, sorry, we have done, not last two years, <laughs> but in the my, more distant past we have done where it's like you get a million and a million gives you yeah. a chance to V1. Yeah. You don't get V2 with a million. In most yeah. cases, yeah. unless you're extremely capital efficient. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, and most things like we said need the V2. They have some fail. They need iteration. It's on the second or third thing. And I think the US is brilliant at giving you large enough runway to have V2, V3, V4. Yeah. 
but then also I go back to fuck, I'm just oscillating between the two. Like Toby at Shopify said to me the other day that the best businesses are built around constraints, whether artificial or real. Yeah. And so I don't know the answer. I'm just chatting shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but look, it's it's not about the exact answer, but it's about the the truth. Like looking at a company, we we take a 10, 15 year perspective and 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 like exclamate any cycle thinking or, or whatever just think about what is healthy and uh, and uh, and what makes sense to build a great company and i think that's something i hate about vc that that we're um, i mean there are a thousand ways to be a great entrepreneur and we have lps who have built family businesses over 100 years we have people who have bootstrapped companies and we have the aggressive vc driven founders but i think in the vc space there's too much hype about what's right what's not right as a founder just think totally independently how much money do i need which people do i want to hire um and and kind of what is my what are my milestones in the next one or two years and and then raise the money that you need and not not over raise maybe over raise a little bit to have a little more runway it will always put you in an incredibly good position to raise the next round if you do well and believe me i think you can optimize so much for ownership in the later rounds if you really kill it and the company goes through the roof and you have great metrics that's when business models start to be predictable and that's when all the growth stage funds, I mean, that's where you can really optimize valuation and kind of protect ownership. But I think it's not at the seed or, or A stage uh, raising raising too ballsy. You mentioned the family offices. Um, there's many great entrepreneurs with incredible family offices and institutions built in Europe. Yeah. You said before to me uh, that they can become Europe's Google. Yeah. How can they become Europe's Google, Rob? <laughs> Makes a lot I of would sense, love right? to know, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Look, I think. Um, and, By the way, and you I interrupt love me Bruno if I'm Lo talking Cucinati, too long again. So, right? All good. <laughs> no, no, roll. So I think you know, if you look at our tech ecosystem globally, there is a huge shift from consumer internet to B two B. And if you look at the past 20, 30 years, consumer internet was Silicon Valley, and that, that was the ecosystem that was thriving. If you look at B two B. What enables B2B, it's all those industrial companies that get disrupted across their supply chains. And if you look at Europe, the DNA of our economy are all those world market leaders in the industrial space, whether it's the car companies like BMW, Peugeot, whether it's the Miele's, the Swarovski's. And I think together they are the biggest enablement of disruption in B2B globally that we have. That's a huge asset that we have in Europe that no other continent on earth has. And that's why we built companies like Salonis, who are global category leader for process mining, your iPath for RPA. And I think there are many more companies in the B2B space that can become global market leaders out of Europe. And the interesting thing is, you know, and back to your Google question, we always complain that we don't have a Google, Facebook, Amazon, or Tencent who are mm. the most profitable companies in their clusters and they're the biggest tech drivers next to VCs. But what we have in Europe is 90% of our companies are family businesses. They are highly profitable. They are run by entrepreneurs that can make fast decisions, take more risks, think long term, that have an incredible alpha knowledge in their domain and that own global supply chains. If you take those family businesses together, I think this is our Google. If we unlock the alpha domain knowledge in those verticals, if we unlock the profitability, if we get that into the VC ecosystem, I think this is how we can really kind of build our Google together um, Combining the domain knowledge and the, and the capital available, and I think we have to serve our ecosystem the way our ecosystem is built, and not copy Silicon Valley. What are the barriers to collectivizing those units in the way that you said? And is that done by a supranational kind of government body, organization, yeah. institution, or is that done by a private institution like Visionaries? I think it's a combination. First, those companies and those people need to be entrepreneurs and go back to their roots. It's interesting. If you look at those family businesses that are 100, 200, some 50 years old, they used to be risk takers. They used to be contrarian. That's what made them successful. But some of them are now in their like pretty, pretty high ages and they're not taking risks anymore. They're just kind of stagnating. I think they need to get ahead of the wave again, unlock capital, take risks again, investing into really new topics. I mean, what is their business model otherwise in 10 years? That's the first thing. So they, they they need to do it. Who can catalyze it? I mean, that's the core business model of visionaries that we just, we have 25 of those family entrepreneurs because we think their domain knowledge and, and their capital is essential for B2B companies that we back. Um, I think, yeah, this is something where connecting those dots between those companies and the startup ecosystem is 
something where I see huge potential in Europe. It's something we've done with La Familia, with visionaries, but it's something we can take to a much different level. Can I be honest? I find there's a real consumer education challenge to be had with a lot of European family offices. Like my LP base is 90% US. But I'm very yeah. grateful to have great US institutions, yeah. but they get it. They're yeah. fast, they're smart, they're yeah. great partners. And the Europeans, I mean, they're slow. You have to explain yeah. everything. And then they turn up with like a $2 million check after, you yeah. know, knowing them for 10 years and, you know, yeah. taking their kids to Sardinia. Yeah. I mean, like, fuck. Like, am I wrong or am I actually right? Yeah. Both. If you had asked me this question three years ago, I would have said, yeah, like, uh, how can we get all those companies really getting active because family offices is something that hasn't happened in Europe like for the last yeah. 30 years, diversification. But we have hasn't. so many. We There's 1,100 so family offices in London. Did you know that? If you look at the dry powder, it's, it's in the trillions, but it's really the domain knowledge. So let me give you two or three examples why I'm positive and why I'm encouraged. Take BioNTech, which is maybe the most successful startup we ever had out of Germany. It was a 130 million seed round led by the Strungmann brothers who were basically farmer entrepreneurs. 130 like, million seed round. 130 million seed round in 2008, middle of the financial crisis. They had balls. They took risk to invest. I mean, they not only did biotech, they maybe did 20 investments where 15 others didn't work, but they understand biotech. They have domain knowledge because they've built a billion dollar business in that industry. And they've taken the risk to find that company that is now, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 billion market cap. And we have in our network... Do you know what price they did the 130 at? <laughs> I, uh, I'm sure you can find online. Uh, but that's an example of, you know, alpha domain knowledge, deep capital pools, taking risks. If we multiply that the 1,500 times you mentioned, we can do this with cardiac device manufacturer, with like all those specialty companies. I think it's incredible what we can unlock. And the one thing why I'm optimistic, don't underestimate how fast those companies can move. Take Max Fisman, he inherited Fisman from his father, it took him three years and a lot of work to get 40,000 employees into the digital age, you have the whole energy thing that happened in Europe, kind of attack it with fast decision making, act fast during COVID, and he's in his early 30s. And we have many of those next gen entrepreneurs who are very intelligent, who are ambitious to maybe even reach something higher than their parents did, and can take fast decisions, take risks, think long term. Let's bring them into the B2B ecosystem because that's something unique that typically US VC funds can't do, that multi-stage funds can't do, but which is essential to lock, unlock the alpha in B2B. I would say a final one, but I like ending before we do a quick fire on our positivity. If you have a dream and you can cast yourself out till 2028, 20, five years, uh, where is the European ecosystem then for you in your dream? It's all gone to plan. In my dream... Venture capital itself got disrupted for the first time in history because VC are investing in disruption, but they have been the least disruptive industry themselves in the last 50 years. If you ask me what it needs to unlock the European ecosystem, it's the domain smartness, taking risk in verticals, and it's the capital. And I think we have a first generation of billionaire B2B founders, like the founders of Adyen, of Checkout, Guillaume, take, take like all those people that reinvest in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. take take Daniel who let the 100 million seat round in housing or mm -hmm. Series A round. And we have the Google, the family entrepreneur. So together, I would say, if things go right, do we really need the traditional VC funds anymore? Or can we build a smarter approach, unlocking the domain knowledge of those people and the capital that these people has? to kind of back the next generation of uh, B2B entrepreneurs. <laughs> You're not dissing me. I totally agree. I, 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 my, my job yeah. is to build the next great venture firm at the intersection of venture yeah. and media and to leverage media products yeah. to allow me to be better investors. I, I tweeted this the other day, but I don't think 20VC is a media company. I think yeah. it's a data company. Like every it's a what? It's a data company. Yeah. Like, you know, we yeah. <laughs> before this show, we spoke to eight founders that you work with yeah. and now have like 32 pages of notes on you. Nice. <laughs> Can I buy them? Or what do I need to do? Uh, to no. no. I, ironically, no, you can't. But uh, <laughs> but but we have so, and we've got this over yeah. 3,000 shows. Yeah. And so you just have incredible data. Yeah. Um, I, I work with Visionary, so that's our vision. You know, we want to. We act like any venture capital fund, the fund is structured like any fund, but we only have those entrepreneurs as our LPs. And our vision is really to 
take venture capital a little bit to the next level, unlocking this domain knowledge and those capital pools. I think it's something for Europe that would fit our ecosystem. No, I, I totally agree. Um, I want to do a quick fire round. So I say a short statement and you give me immediate thoughts. Sound okay? Trying to do my best, my so, friend. Uh, I, we messaged about this one before and you said, oh, I can't think of them. I'm like, oh, well, you have 24 hours, so good luck. Um, <laughs> if you were to invest in one European seed firm other than your own, which would it be? Yeah. I'll pick two, Beyond Capital and Cocoa, because they are both micro funds. So Beyond buy. Capital? Beyond Capital, it's Gloria. Oh, yeah. She was with Index before. She's one of the smartest and most hungry young VCs that I know. I had a chance at 20 and VC, but didn't. Okay. I'll bring her on the show. <laughs> and Carmen, who's also running a 50 million, 15 million micro fund. I believe in those young managers that are hungry, hyper smart, talented, and still want to have this kind of ambition to win. I, 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 I'm in Kakoa too. I, I think Carmen has done unbelievably well in terms yeah. of visibility. Every deal that we meet at Seed, they've always yeah. met Kakoa. Yeah. Um, totally agree with you. Yeah. A series A firm in Europe, which would you invest in? You mentioned, I could mention the usual ones like Excel Index, Sequoia and the likes, but let's, let, let's pick a different one. I think Felix Capital is a great company because, you know, that's an entrepreneurial run venture capital fund with a great Focus value proposition. They are doing incredibly well on getting new partners on board, like Julia recently, who mm -hmm. has been an angel investor in, in Pigment Central. I like him a lot. I think he's an amazing partner. So, and Felix <laughs> is an entrepreneur in VC, like the, the company. So I like this. JC is like my big brother. I love Julian. So I totally uh, agree. Uh, <laughs> I love the fact that I, I just get to ask these questions. <laughs> I don't have to answer them. Uh, it's such a good job. Um, tell me, uh, growth firm. Um, Difficult because I think they're by nature more global, but if I had to pick one, I steal your favorite one, 83 North, because mm. they're super humble, very domain specific. Concentrated fund size as well. For, concentrated like, fund mm. size. They go deep. They don't make a big show out of it. Uh, they work hard with the founders. Love them. I totally agree with you. <laughs> Again, I just like pummel you with questions <laughs> and I don't have to answer any of them. Brilliant. Uh, what have you changed your mind on in the last 12 months? I think really, and, and don't laugh at me, I think growth is not the right North Star, like economic growth for our Western economy anymore. Because I think, you know, I, I mean, in venture capital, we are investing in growth and that's my biggest passion and like <laughs> technology change. That's my confusion. But if you look at what it does with kind of, um, if you look at the Western world and, and we're always striving for growth, it has to be economic growth. It has to be like, that's the North Star for each sure. country, uh, each, each company then and for each employee. And I think if you look, I think our, our Western economy, I'm not talking about all the world, but it's so overdeveloped in so many areas of the society mm. that we're so far above the peak of, of what is really healthy in terms of growth that I think we need a different, you see it with, with whether it's energy, whether it's the whole kind of um, climate change this, 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 this discussion, all those topics you can't solve anymore with, with just our stupid North Star of we have to economically grow and you see the society partying, you see it. I think um, it, it's not the right North Star anymore. We need a different value system, a new a reinvented adjusted value system for our society. What was the craziest thing that happened in 2020 to 22? Like the way you're remembering it. What? I can't believe that. I think Justin Bieber moving into crypto, buying a 1.3 billion <laughs> JPEG that is now maybe worth 90% less. I think it's a good example of what happened in the last two years. Oh man, I, can't, I remember buying chain runners. I remember getting uh, yeah, a okay. couple of teeters in and like, that, was not a, that was not a good investment, you know. Yeah. Um, what one word would be on your tombstone and why that word? I, it will be something in the direction for Kate, love of my life, because, you know, family for me, as much as I love venture capital and tennis, even though I'm not talented enough, is the most important thing in life. And if I had to put one thing on my tombstone, it would be related to that. Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> I wasn't expecting How about yourself? Uh, I just got to know your mother, so. <laughs> I think, I think persistent. Persistent. Okay. Yeah. I, I think just, you know, I will sprain ankles, tear ligaments, and I will still run. And I, I, to the point where it's detrimental. It's not a good uh, thing. Uh, <laughs> it can be a good thing, but I will just never, ever give up. Uh, uh. <laughs> Again. It, it, it's a good one. I mean, for it's one I would copy for myself just with work-related. And actually, it also applies to many private life things. But 
where, where, where does it bring you like persistence like if you just apply it on your on your job like, like what oh, does it mean uh, for your private life uh, on it means actually loneliness on your private life um but on your work life it means success mm -hmm. if you are persistent and every single day you show up and you get better and better and better which you will do if you show up every day um, you, you will win so you prioritize already work over over private life you have 70 years to go so if you want to I, put I it on your I, tombstone i, I uh, think i think can also I be think, a different word. i just think there's a time in life for optimizing for different things uh, and like in your 20s when you have the energy when you you know maybe don't feel ready for children and don't feel ready for that family and you love what you do the other thing people always say to me is like oh you know when you actually regret giving every I work every weekend regardless yeah. when you regret you know spending every weekend in a recording studio no i yeah. love it It gives me energy. And you know what? It may not do when I'm 35, okay. but actually, you know, going back to the relationship to money, and by that point, I hope to have financial security where I, I don't need to. Wow. And actually, then I can be a great dad. I love kids. <laughs> It's super important to me to be at the tennis match or the wow. clarinet concert. Wow. So, fuck no. Wow. I, I wish, you know, uh, the work you do in private is the work you're rewarded for in public. Wow. And it's like the dark hours in the studio. Uh, mm. what you get credit for on twitter yeah yeah i think it's the beauty if you love doing what you do for work there's no work life balance life is work but it's yeah. also the danger and i've had it also in the last five six seven years really that you just on the weekends you just don't do anything else because you love it so much and suddenly a lot of your friends around you're also in the startup ecosystem and Uh, I, think, I think the hard thing is you can get to a stage where the only thing that stimulates you discussion wise and intellectually is work. Mm. And actually that's very dangerous, I think, because yeah. like you should be stimulated by, you know, your other half talking about medicine or they yeah. could be a child psychologist or yeah. they could be a biologist and other intellectually stimulating, but not your areas. I think the challenge that I have is unless it's about venture or business and economics in general, yeah. I couldn't really give a shit. Yeah. That's not so good. Well, I'm happy that I have this other thing. In my life. <laughs> I can tell you, it's, I love that. Well, I'm happy that I've I got worked it. hard to get it into your life as well. Man, who's your who's your investing mentor? I have great respect for Doug Leono for the fact that you know met him so many times last year or the year before that he's a, he was back then a 65 year old or 64 year old person that was still so fast. 150 percent hungry he was working incredibly hard like any of us would work in our age and i think keeping that hungriness keeping that discipline of working 150 percent hard still at that age is something that i think is very inspiring i think it's inspiring how he has been we discussed about being an entrepreneur and an investor at the same time and mm. how he's balanced it building Sequoia as a company with with Michael Moritz, but also being being an investor. And I think, you know, in VC, and it's again discussing about our future of when do you want to retire or not, I think it's an either all in or not business because the moment you start hanging out maybe in southern France at your holiday home and tanning and only working three days a week, I think that moment you're not a good VC anymore because every founder will say that person is not hungry anymore and is not the sparing partner I want to have on the board mm -hmm. going all in with me. That's what I admire about Doug. Not yeah. many VCs I've seen that, that have done it until that age. I see unwavering commitment. I, uh, I totally agree. What is yours? Me. Who's yours? Who's mine? Mine's Mark Evans. Mm -hmm. Mark Evans is, uh, I think, probably one of the greatest jewels of European venture that you know I think few people know about. Mm -hmm. um, He's taught me so many things. Yeah. He's taught me, I, he always taught me this, which is, you know, you're never wrong to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And whenever I come up with a difficult decision, I'm always like, huh, that's what's the good, right that's thing? One. Like yeah. even the right thing may be hard, yeah. but what's the right thing? Yeah. And actually, I know it sounds quite simple, but that clarifying question, and you know what? He provides me security. Yeah. You know, like your family doctor, when you're younger, you feel safe with them. Yeah. I, when I have my hardest problems, I will go to him uh -huh. and he will give me structure in a world of confusion. <laughs> yeah. That's invaluable. Yeah. That's mine. Uh, final one for you, my friend. With 2028, is Visionaries like the next BlackRock adventure? Is it a boutique? Where do we want Visionaries to be in 2028? 
I don't want to think that way because then it's a linear goal that you have. Uh, we, 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 we try to turn things around. So what I want to do, I'm, I don't want to retire yet. Anytime <laughs> soon. I'm hungry and, and uh, I want to build visionaries to endure the next 30 or 40 years. And I think the ingredient is the network that we build of those great entrepreneurs because the likelihood that something great will come out of those people that have already built something great in their life is always very high, no matter if it's a seed fund or an early growth fund or a growth fund taking a lead or another pre-IPO fund. We'll see. I think that that will that story will be written by our co-entrepreneurs that we hired in our team that have this degrees of freedom to build it. And we always say, calling a dream crazy is not an insult, it's a compliment. And we hope we have many crazy dreams, but they will be coming out of this setup in the next five years. And I can't tell you yet what this will be. <laughs> I love that. Rob, thank you so much for doing this. I've loved this, my friend. And I so appreciate your friendship. This was awesome, Harry. Thanks so much for having me again. You're a star, man. <laughs>